And although I'm always excited to do these interviews, I'm especially excited today mm -hmm. as I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Rita Marie Lascalzo as we'll be chatting about thyroid and insulin resistance. Uh, so let me give Dr. Rita Marie's background as she is the founder of the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology, is passionately committed to transforming our current broken disease focus system into a true healthcare system where every practitioner is skilled at finding the root cause of health challenges and uses the wisdom of nature combined with modern scientific research to restore balance. And then Dr. Rita Marie is also a licensed doctor of chiropractic with certifications in acupuncture, nutrition, herbal medicine, and heart math. She specializes in digestion, thyroid, adrenal, and insulin resistance. And I know you didn't include it in your bio here, but also great deal of knowledge when it comes to genetics. Mm -hmm. And she also is a master at using palate pleasing whole fresh food medicine and is a best selling author, speaker, and internationally recognized nutrition and functional health authority with over 30 years of clinical experience. And then she also has a podcast called Reinvent Healthcare. And this provides health and wellness practitioners around the globe to be part of the movement to provide root cause care to people in need. And thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rita Marie. I'm so excited to be here. I love to, I love talking about this topic and I'm honored to be on your podcast. Yeah, it's an honor having you as well. And so I normally ask my guests to begin by discussing their background. And so if you could just please briefly discuss how you got to where you are today, that'd be great. Well, I think like a lot of people in functional health and wellness um, came through my own journey of illness. So in my 20s, my health broke down and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And I went to all kinds of specialists, neurologists and uh, gastroenterologists and uh, ear, nose and throat docs because of the symptoms I was having. And um, I just wasn't getting well. And I asked the faded question one day, I don't know where it even came from, in the gastroenterologist office after they said, you don't have an ulcer, good news. Um, and I said, great, so what's wrong with me and what do I do? And they said, we don't know, just keep taking the ulcer medication. And so a little bit of intelligence perkled up and said, huh, what do you mean? I'm 25. I'm supposed to keep taking ulcer medication. I don't have an ulcer. What am I supposed to do? Like for the rest of my life? They said, oh, maybe, but in, until you don't need it anymore. And so the little question popped up and I'm like, could it be my diet? And they looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, no, of course not. Diet has nothing to do with your health. And I set out to prove them wrong. And this was back in 1985, right? When very little, or 84, actually, when we didn't have summits and we didn't have podcasts and we didn't have any of what we have now. And people were in the dark about this, you know, about all this stuff that we just freely talk about and people get the information. It wasn't available then. So I, long story short, went and did a whole lot of research you know, discovered toxicity, discovered food allergies, discovered insulin resistance and, you know, uh, hypoglycemia and all kinds of things, did some things to get myself better, but it was took a long time. And so that's when I decided to jump ship and get leave my computer job, which prepared me eloquently for what I do now, because I was a diagnostician. I was helping to fix breakdowns in the software on the computer. So now I just said, oh, I just changed the hardware and the software. And now I was working on the body. And that's where it started. And I've been passionate ever since to help people to not have to work so hard to figure it out. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And um, yeah, so we're going to dive into insulin resistance, tied into thyroid resistance and so I don't know where you want to start. I guess it's probably best to start with insulin resistance. Maybe we'll talk about what insulin is. And, you know, if you want to also mention, get into metabolic flexibility as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So insulin's a hormone. A lot of people don't even realize that, but insulin's a hormone. The only, the hormones that people think about when we say hormones are, you know, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, and a more educated, oh, thyroid, but insulin's actually a hormone and its job is to take the sugar from the food you eat glucose and put it into the cells. So the mitochondria in the cells can then make energy. And what happens is because of the diet lifestyle that we live, um, not me and you, but 
other people out there are living. It's like loaded with starches and and sugars and processed foods and hydrogenated fats and things that are damaging to the body. And what happens is the receptors on the cells and every cell has receptors, little places that hormones latch onto and then get entrance into the cells. And the receptors for insulin get damaged they get tired, they get resistant, and they start to want to protect the inside of the cells from that hormone because there's so much of it because we have so much glucose and starch that's converted into glucose coming in. And so we develop something called insulin resistance. So when we develop insulin resistance, then all that sugar stays in the blood doesn't get into the cells. And we have hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia eventually can lead to diabetes. But long, 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 and I emphasize long, before it becomes diabetes, it's a problem in the body. It's a problem because of the damaging effects of insulin. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the damaging effects of insulin on thyroid function in a bit. But um, getting back to metabolic flexibility and what is that, right? So we're intended to, we can burn carbohydrates or we can burn fat as fuel. And most people are eating enough glucose all day long to just, they just look for glucose. And when they're doing that all the time, the body's going, I can burn glucose. I can burn glucose. Whoops, there's no more glucose. I need glucose. So we get food cravings, we get low energy in between meals, et cetera. When somebody's metabolically flexible, it means that they can switch between fat burning and glucose burning. But you can't be metabolically flexible if you're eating, you know, cornflakes and sugar toast with butter and um, jelly on it and all that kind of stuff. You just can't be metabolically flexible. And recent research actually it was 2000, either 17 or 18, no, 18, 19, something somewhere around there was that. 88% of the population is metabolically unwell, meaning that whole glucose, insulin metabolism and the way it's supposed to work doesn't work properly. 88%, think about that. That means 12% of the population is metabolically well and healthy. 12%, that's tiny. And this was pre-pandemic. So my guess is it's much higher percentage of metabolically unwell people over the last few years. And metabolic unwellness leads to all sorts of problems, cardiac problems, kidney problems, blood pressure problems, and imbalances in other hormones, right? So thyroid is one of the, it's a train wreck when insulin's out of balance. And we really can't get the thyroid in balance if we continue with the process of hyperinsulin, too much insulin, and insulin resistance. So that's in a nutshell, insulin and the whole concept of metabolic health. So it's more of a cellular problem is it's insulin resistance, too much insulin. So the, like you said, the problem is insulin, not enough, well, too much insulin, but it's not getting into the cell, correct? But it's not getting into the cell. So we have the symptoms of, and this is true of all hormone resistance. People know about thyroid, uh, insulin resistance. We've kind of started to hear about leptin resistance but you can develop resistance to all the hormones and the way it manifests is the body shows signs of too little of that hormone, even though in the blood, there's either enough or too much of that hormone. And the cells are smart, right? They know that too much thyroid in a cell causes somebody to be hyperthyroid, right? And all kinds of the complications that you talk about a lot. Same thing with insulin, right? Too much insulin in the cell can cause lack of elasticity. It actually damages endothelial linings and it damages cells. So the body tries to protect itself from it and it becomes resistant. And you can get resistance to hormones by taking too much hormone. So we think, oh, hormones are just, they're not like drugs. It's not like these chemical things that are foreign to the body. It's natural to the body. So we should be able to take hormones safely. But in reality, we have to take just the right amount to fill in what the body isn't doing. Otherwise, you develop lots of complications of hyper um, hormone, but you also develop the resistance to that hormone. All right. Well, thanks for explaining that. And what, what are some of the common causes of insulin resistance? Why do so many people have insulin resistance these days? Have you looked at what people are eating? 
That's one, what people are eating, the garbage, the processed food. Number two, stress. So what happens is under stress, we release a lot of a hormone, another hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is meant to help us run away from hungry animals, right? Tiger's chasing me. I need cortisol. I need to run away. And so one of the mechanisms by which cortisol works is to mobilize stored energy. And that could be in the form of fat, protein, or glycogen, car carbohydrate, and then create more sugar in the blood so we can run away from tigers. And in that situation, it's a good mechanism. And we don't get in trouble really, unless we do slow down and get eaten by the tiger, right? But for the most part, it doesn't get us in trouble to have that elevated sugar. It actually helps us, right? But in the day-to-day -day modern life, I don't know about you, but I haven't had a tiger chase me recently, right? I've had, I've had deadlines chase me. I've had lots of, you know, anxieties, perhaps I don't really get anxious, but people have lots of fear and anxiety around our current world, the economics, the, you know, the, the crime, all that kind of stuff. And that causes that same stress response as if we have a hungry tiger chasing us, except we don't get to run away from the tiger and burn that energy. It sits in the blood and it causes that elevation of the sugar. What the pancreas does when it sees the sugar so high and it's not getting into the cells, it goes, oh, we just need more insulin. We just need more insulin. It keeps producing more and more insulin and then the cells become even more insulin resistant. So I think a lot of it is a, is a modern lifestyle disease. We can change it. And I've seen people completely reverse even type two diabetes within two to three weeks of changing their diet getting on a good stress regime, sleeping, moving, you know, all the basic foundations of good health. That's how we can reverse this and prevent it. And there are genetic factors that play in. I have a lot of the genes that predispose me to diabetes. So I have to be a little bit more careful than maybe somebody else who doesn't have those genes. But for the most part, the genes are this much of it and the lifestyle is this much of it. So similar with autoimmunity, like if someone has the genetics to Graves' disease or Hashimoto's or a different autoimmune condition doesn't necessarily mean they will develop that exactly. condition. And same thing, if someone has certain genetics, doesn't mean they absolutely will develop insulin resistance or another right. problem. And just because they don't have the genetics doesn't mean they won't develop it, right? You can, you can outsmart your genetics with good diet and lifestyle, but you can also defy them, your good genetics and get diseases if you mistreat the body, it's just, you know, it needs, it's like a car, right? We don't go, oh, I'm going to put jelly beans in the gas tank. It must be tired of that high octane fuel. I'm just going to try something else. Don't work that way. Gums up the mechanism. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you expanded beyond diet because diet plays a role, but you mentioned the stress and then also sleep. You know, if someone's only getting four or five hours sleep consistently, that also right. could be a factor. Absolutely. It's a huge factor. Yeah. yeah. How about the, so what testing do you recommend? Do you, a lot of, as you know, most conventional medical doctors, they just look at a fasting glucose and that's pretty much what they go yeah. by when it comes to insulin resistance and type Absolutely. 2 diabetes. Absolutely. And that's totally like the fasting insulin is actually the last thing to change. So you can have this problem going on for decades. That's why I said a long, long, long time. You can have it going on for decades actually before the fasting glucose goes too high. Plus their ranges for the fasting glucose are a little bit too wide and not narrow enough. But the other test that I recommend an early test is insulin. Test your insulin. We can see kids in their teens with hyperinsulinemia and you can tell by some of their behaviors, right? They can't go you know, more than a couple of hours without food because they are. But the, the point is that you can test the insulin. You can test the fasting insulin. You can test something called hemoglobin A1C, which yeah, there's some, a little bit of discrepancy or, or maybe um, sometimes it's not quite as accurate as it could be in somebody who's extremely anemic or in somebody who's a, a, an intense athlete, but you get a general range. Hemoglobin A1C is how much of your red blood cells are sugar coated. What percentage? And we all have some percentage of them sugar-coated because they're bathing in this glucose serum that, you know, the glucose that's in the serum. And so around five is a good amount, right? A little bit less, a little bit more. 
but the conventional medicine looks at 5.6. And by the time somebody gets to a 5.6 in hemoglobin A1C, they're already, their, their average glucose is around 119. At 119, 120, and as it starts to go up, we're getting all of the complications of diabetes in somebody who's never been diagnosed. I have worked with patients who have had complications that are typically diabetic, diabetic nephropathy, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy. They're not diabetic. Doctor said, oh, your glucose is 95. You're just fine. They missed the boat. And this poor person, because of the, the swings up and down over the years make a difference. I remember one person having that situation and he went and got his A1C checked and it was 10, double, more than double what it should have been, right? And no wonder he was having these things, but because of his big wide variations and swings, his by the time it made to morning, it was okay. It was quote unquote normal, probably because he was producing so much insulin you know, and his insulin was high as well, that it got his sugars down when he had the, you know, eight hour um, fasting window, right, or sleeping window. But most of them are not uh, recommending what I recommend is postprandial glucose, you get yourself a little glucose meter, poke your finger and you see what are your meals doing? What is your stress level doing? What happens when you don't have a good night's sleep? Uh, what happens when you exercise versus when you don't, you can see all this. There's the newest thing on the market. I've been talking about these forever, but I've been, I've been having people test their glucose, their postprandial for like, I don't know, the last 20 years. But more recently, it was like, oh, there's these things called con continuous glucose meters. And you can actually wear it. I have one on my arm there underneath the, the bright blue patch, right? And um, it's basically a continuous glucose meter. And it's got a little filament, not even as thick as an acupuncture needle, a little filament that's under the skin, and it's detecting the glucose. And so you know at any moment what the glucose, oh, I just ate a donut. My glucose is 192. Oh, I just had a nice salad with avocado and tomato and lettuce, and my glucose is 98. Wow, what a difference, right? So there's all kinds of ways that people can be empowered to take charge of their own health, which I know that's what you and I are all about. Yeah, well, definitely. And when it comes to the levels, so you mentioned what hemoglobin A1C around five, so a little bit higher, a little bit lower. So if someone's like a 5.4 or 5.5, so you're suggesting I'm That's suggesting let's get um let's get you really um taught and educated about how do you get it lower? How do you get it down to that 5, 5.1, 4.9, that range? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an early warning sign. Are, are there concerns if it gets too low? Sure. If it gets too low, there's probably somebody who's in a hypoglycemic state most of the time, right? Yeah. There's this whole thing. You talk about hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia is, oh my God, the blood sugar is low. We have to eat something to bring it up. But most of the symptoms that people are having when they feel like they're hypoglycemic, like their blood sugar is too low, is actually hyperglycemia. The blood sugar is too high, but it's not getting into the cells. So the cellular sugar is too low. So yeah, if the A1C goes down to like 4.5, maybe your average glucose is, I don't know, in the 70s. But that means that there may be times when it's lower. So you just have to watch, is the person symptomatic? And what's happening overnight? What's happening with the meals? They just might have very tight control that their body keeps it in a very tight range. So yeah, we we investigate further if it goes too low. But yeah, otherwise, because you, you need sugar in your system to get cellular function. And then when it comes to insulin, so I know some functional medicine practitioners like to see that insulin, the fasting insulin below five. So would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think between two and five would be the quote unquote, ideal range, but actually between two and three is even more ideal. So that's, that's the range I like to see it. If someone has a fasting insulin between two and three, it could be perfect, or it could be a sign that they're actually have been very high, but they're heading into like a pancreatic failure, or they have antibodies that are attacking their pancreas. So I always investigate that. I look at how are their symptoms? Um, what are the other factors playing in, but if they have a fasting insulin of 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.
uh, hemoglobin A1C of 5.1, fasting glucose of 79, they feel good, they have good energy, then it's perfect. But if they're complaining about, you know, some other things, then I would want to do what's called a postprandial insulin, where I'd have them eat their highest carbohydrate meal that they typically would eat, and then check it to see if the pancreas responds to see if that insulin level goes up. Shouldn't go up a lot, but it should, it should respond. And that might, if not, it might mean that they have some pancreatic failure going on. And how soon after eating would you recommend that? Usually 45 minutes to an hour. That's whenever you look at the studies, it always shows that the insulin and the glucose usually peak right around 45 minutes. So somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. So what, I guess with regular fasting insulin or even postprandial, when do, do you get what, well, what regular, cause I, I haven't done postprandial postprandial um, in, um, insulin testing, but I've done, you know, I do regular right. insulin testing all the time. So do you get concern if it's like a six or seven, or do you not really get concerned until it's in double digits? Oh, I get concerned as soon as it's above five. And when I say concerned, it means I'm educating somebody. This There's an indication that you're producing too much insulin. Here are the downsides of too much insulin. Oh, you have a family history of cardiovascular disease. Too much insulin stiffens your blood vessel lining so that you're more prone to have a heart attack if you go to run for the bus because your, your blood vessels can expand and other things, high blood pressure and um, thyroid resistance and other cellular uh, hormonal resistance. So at that point, I'm investigating and I'm helping them to you know bring it down within the two to five range. Okay. Thyroid resistance. So let's let's talk about how that relates to insulin resistance and, and also how that presents on a thyroid panel. It doesn't present on a thyroid panel. So here's the deal. It can present as a perfectly normal thyroid panel. It has normal TSH, normal T3, T4, free T3, free T4. But the person has clear symptoms of thyroid problems, right? And so we go, wait a minute. So the typical Western approach is, oh, you have constipation, here's a laxative. Oh, you have depression, here's an antidepressant. Oh, you have you know, dry skin, put some moisturizer uh, on it. So they're not addressing it as a com compilation. Like those are thyroid, those are low thyroid symptoms. So I always say, if it looks like a thyroid problem, and it sounds like a thyroid problem, it's a thyroid problem, but it's not with the thyroid itself, right? So those numbers look good, yet the person presents with thyroid symptoms. And it's usually because the receptors have become resistant. And there's some really common imbalances that affect the thyroid receptors that cause them to underwork, right? So we have um, homocysteine, how many people do you test homocysteine? I, I listened to your podcast episode on your, fa your favorite test. You test homocysteine on people, right? Elevated homocysteine can damage the thyroid receptors. So we're looking at that. And what is elevated homocysteine caused by? Well, usually a deficiency of vitamin B6, B12, folate. There's a number of other things that are less important, but those are your majors. So we look at that. Deficiency of vitamin A can affect the thyroid receptors. So if somebody's not getting enough vitamin A or they are getting enough vitamin A in their diet but have a problem with fat digestion and fat soluble vitamins. So those are two very important things. But the most important one that I think most people suffer from is either excess cortisol or not enough cortisol. So in order for those thyroid receptors to work properly, we need the right amount of cortisol. So stress can respond. Cytokines, we all heard of cytokines over the last few years in terms of cytokine storm, but cytokines are inflammatory mediators in the body and excess inflammation, excess cytokines damage the thyroid receptors. And last but not least, our good old friend, insulin. Insulin not only causes receptor resistance for insulin, it causes receptor resistance for thyroid and other hormones as well. Right. Now, so you said on a thyroid panel, you, it very well might be normal, so you, you can't always pay attention. But in some situations, wouldn't it be elevated, like the thyroid hormone level? Like I know in some cases of thyroid hormone resistance, you'll actually see thyroid hormone levels look on the higher side, and usually in, in the case of hyperthyroidism, that would result in depressed TSH. 
But in the case of thyroid hormone resistance, sometimes you'll see it elevated on a thyroid panel, but TSH will actually be elevated as well, which shouldn't be the case it normally when you have too high of a thyroid right. hormone. Yes. In fact, that's why I said it can look normal. So there's no classic way it presents. Mm -hmm. But I always tell people when they're looking to solve their thyroid problems, and I, I give people a document that shows them the different kinds of imbalances and what to do, you know, if the T4 is, is good, but the T3 is low or vice versa. So we can address those imbalances. But if you don't address that, there might be thyroid resistance and find out you can address all those other things that are out of balance, get them in perfect balance, have the panel look perfect, yet there's still a problem right? They're still symptomatic. So I always say address that at the same, right from the start, assume thyroid resistance. If you're wrong, great. But, you know, check the homocysteine, check vitamin A status, address the stress levels, right? Address those things and address the insulin because that's super important. But yeah, excess of any hormone can cause resistance to that. So it's a clue when that hormone is high, um, it's damaging the, it's, you know, turning off those receptors. All right. Well, thanks for clarifying. And then, so as far as fixing the problem, so again, diet, stress management, getting proper sleep, as you mentioned, um, right. so really all these diet and lifestyle factors, the homocysteine, which as you mentioned, could re oftentimes relate to nutrient deficiencies, specifically of right. some of the B vitamins and, you know, it's, uh, other nutrient deficiencies like vitamin A. So really just trying to address all these imbalances. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So what I find, and you may find this with your patients as well, people want quick fixes because that's what they've grown accustomed to throughout their life. You get a headache, you pop a Motrin, you get, you know, stomach ache, you pop some antacids or whatever. And that's not the way the body really works, right? There's no quick fix. We have to address the underlying causes and we have to look at what's the gut function like. We know in a lot of thyroid issues, especially the autoimmune and all autoimmune conditions anyway, we usually have some sort of leaky gut, hyperpermeability of the gut lining. We have some inflammation, we have some dysbiosis. So we have to address that. We have to address all the different stressors on the body, not just the mental and emotional stressors, but heavy metal stress and mold and, you know, all kinds of things like that. So Lyme, you know, chronic uh, low grade infections that aren't resolved. There's all sorts of things that we need to look at as, as a big picture. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that because you're right that a lot of people will focus on the diet, the stress and the exercise, but they still might see elevated hemoglobin A1C and or fasting insulin, but they might have disruption in the gut microbiome, might have a higher toxic load, might have stealth infections, as you mentioned. So there mm -hmm. sounds like there are a lot of things that could at least yeah. be a contributing factor when it comes to insulin resistance, thyroid resistance, pretty much all these hor um, hormone resistance uh, issues. Yeah. Yeah. A few years ago, I did a whole workshop, all, an all day workshop on hormone resistance because he said uh, nobody's teaching this. Right. People need to know how to how to address it. Yeah. So like if someone has I know you kind of answered this, but if they have cortisol resistance, again, they're thinking cortisol, adrenal stress, but they can't just block out time for mind body medicine. I mean, that, they should do that. But if that's all they do, it's probably not going to address the cortisol resistance just doing that. We have to do it all. We can't just pick like, oh, I want to do the stress response, right? The yogis want to do the stress piece and, you know, the foodies want to do the food piece and the marathoners want to do the exercise piece. And there is such a thing as over-exercise, which we can talk about another time. But, you know, we can't just address the pieces that we like, that resonate. We have to address all of it. And the sleep is huge. Like, you know, I don't know about you, but people come in and tell me, oh, yeah, I, I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. I can't sleep more than six hours. That's putting a huge stress on the body and the hormone balance. Yeah, definitely agree. Sleep is a priority. You can't negotiate the sleep. I tried. That's when I developed insulin resistance. Yeah. I mean, we, I think most of us notice a difference, even if it's not reflecting right away in the blood sugar, but like you said, it could take years for that to develop, but you, it could affect the body in many other ways. So how about exercise? So you mentioned exercise, do you, and everyone's different. And there are some people listening to this who might not be able to engage in certain types of exercise, but 
on average, you recommend more resistance training, more cardio, more high intensity interval training? All of the above. Like it depends on the person. Um, ideally you do all of that stuff, but not everybody can do all of that. Some people have injuries in certain areas of their body and they can't move that particular area. So I find that for blood sugar balance, the high intensity interval mm. training works really well. Uh, burst training, you know, 30 seconds of all out, 30 seconds to a minute and then rest for two to three minutes and then do it again, or just do it throughout the day. Sometimes in, sometimes people do it as part of like, you go for a walk and then you run or climb a hill or something for 30 seconds to a minute, get your heart rate going and then continue to just walk. Other people can just in discrete separate times throughout the day, just do 30 seconds to a minute of exercise. And I find that people find that easy to incorporate. Um, but there is such a thing as over-exercising, especially if there's been a lot of stress and the adrenals have been like going and too much exercise for your constitution right now creates a cortisol release. And then that cortisol release puts you into stress mode. So we have to just really watch it. If you are someone who says, I really want to exercise and you go out and you all out, you do weights and interval training, and then you come back and you can't exercise again for three or four days because you're exhausted right? That's a sign that you overdid it. And it, it, the hardest thing is when athletes burn out and they just want to keep doing it and they can't. And we have to just like, you know what? The couch isn't a bad idea right now. Just walk around the block a couple of times. Like keep it light to keep your heart rate going and keep the oxygen flowing. But that's, I find that's harder to get people who are avid exercises, uh, exercisers who are burned out to slow down. That's even harder than some people who have been couch potatoes and don't want to start it, but it's super important to get the right balance of exercise for you. Yeah, definitely agree. I, I've mentioned in past podcast episodes where I was guilty of overtraining and I, I'm pretty sure that was a contributing factor when to the development of my Graves disease condition, you know, years ago. So, so I agree. You don't want to be a couch potato. You, you want movement to be a regular part of your daily activity, but you don't want to overdo it in the gym or at, even at home, you could overtrain. So. And even at home, you know, there's so many little things you can do. If you have a staircase, running up and down the stairs two or three times can get your heart rate up and can be good. Now, if you have a knee problem, you're not going to do that. So you work with your body and the limitations to find things. There are these little uh, exercise uh, things you put on the table, but they're like a bicycle you can put it for your feet, but you can use it for your shoulders. So if you have knee problems or hip problems, you put it on the table and you can get your heart rate up pretty well by just using them as a an, an arm exercise. So there's a lot of options, you know. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And so the last thing I wanted to briefly chat with you about is as uh, intermittent fasting. And, you know, we chatted a little bit before the start of the interview, you know, just to remind you that, you know, some of the listeners have hyperthyroidism and might be losing a lot of weight. So it's not a perfect fit for everyone. But on average, would you say if someone's dealing with insulin resistance and let's say they're gaining a lot of weight, is that something you usually? Oh, ask absolutely. Intermittent fasting. I've been talking about it before it became popular. I've been teaching people on my programs. It's like, 2008 or something like that. We, we had this thing. We didn't call it intermittent fasting. I don't remember what we called it, but it was meal spacing. Let's space your meals out. No more than three meals a day, 12 hours between the last meal and the first meal, minimally. If you can go longer, great. Um, and then finding your fasting window. Some people do great by skipping breakfast and starting to eat later in the afternoon. Some people do horribly with that, and but they're really good at eating first thing in the morning, having another meal and a light dinner. Um, two meals or three meals a day. Some people are doing one meal a day, but some of the research I've seen on that is it actually backfires after a while, that it's not enough and then you gorge yourself and you're putting all this, all these calories in at one time. And I find that with blood sugar meter, because I have a continuous, that if I overeat at a meal, even if it's all low glycemic stuff that I normally would eat, my blood sugar will go up because it's just too much of a load all at once. So I'm a real big fan of intermittent fasting. I've seen amazing results with it to help people get past the plateaus, the weight loss plateaus. And I've seen it work really well for folks who have um, mitochondrial disruption so that their energy is low. And people think, oh my God, I can't not eat to get energy. Yeah, you can. 
it can work really well. And there's a lot of research to that effect. So it works well and it works well for brain stuff. It works really, really well. And that's where a lot of the uh, ketogenic type diets came from. And when you, when you um, have intermittent fasting, you're going longer periods of time, you have more of an opportunity to get into a ketogenic state, especially if you do like a 16 hour overnight to 16 hours or from, you know, bedtime to whatever. That, that will help you to get into a state called autophagy, which helps your body do cleaning out. So, you know, there's so many benefits to intermittent fasting and not for everybody. You do need to be careful if you're a menstruating woman, don't do it the week before your period because it can disrupt your hormones. Um, if you find that you start doing it and your period stop, then it's probably not the right thing for you. So it's not like everything. It's not for everyone. It's certainly not for somebody with hyperthyroidism. It's certainly not for some somebody who's underweight and has a very high metabolic rate, even if they don't have hyperthyroid. And I sneakily say, well, everybody else is told, eat two meals a day, space your meals four to six hours. I say eat every two to three hours, because otherwise they're going to just burn away to nothingness. All right. Well, is there anything that I didn't ask you about insulin resistance, thyroid resistance that I should have asked you? I mean, I know there's a lot that we could talk about, but there's anything so much urgent. To talk about. No, I think that um, here's the thing. If you're working on a thyroid problem and you're ignoring your blood sugar, you're not going to really get very far with healing your thyroid. You must address both. You must address both. And then, so uh, just a final summary or as far as action steps, if someone is looking at their blood test report now and they see they have high hemoglobin A1C and are fasting insulin, would you say just start with diet, cleaning up whole healthy foods, minimizing refined foods and sugars, I assume is a good place to start? That's a great place to start. And watch your sleep. Like make it a point. Some people don't not they they don't sleep not because they can't sleep but because they don't get to bed and that was my situation i have plenty of energy i'm just gonna push it i can just stay up and you know and you do that and then you get a second wind just go to bed like make it a point to move your bedtime back so that it it's before midnight at least and some experts would say by 11 but i haven't done that one yet so i can't recommend it yet <laughs> but i've moved mine back to before midnight right? And I'm really focused on getting seven to eight, seven to eight to nine even hours. And some of the studies show that the closer you get to nine hours, the more rapidly the results and the shifts happen with healing insulin resistance. Yeah, I can't say I'm there yet. Like you, I, I usually strive for seven to eight hours. Not that I wouldn't love to get nine hours, but I'd say most, most nights it's seven to eight. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how can people find out more about you, Dr. Mar uh, Rita Marie? Well, you can find me on Facebook. We do a lot of posts on Facebook and it's just um, Dr. Rita Marie, I think. And then um, same thing on Instagram. And our, we're just reviving our YouTube channel. Same thing, youtube.com slash Dr. Rita Marie. And we're starting to do weekly lives and going to be putting a lot more content out there. And uh, my website, um, if you're a practitioner, um, we have a new website uh, going to be opening up very soon, but the I the email, well, well, the URL is ionemethod.com. And we have a lot of great resources for practitioners um, that I can't wait to share. And my podcast, Reinvent Healthcare. So all those ways, great ways to reach me. Yeah, definitely check out the podcast. Again, I mentioned before we started that I've listened to some of the episodes. Excellent, excellent information. And, uh, you know, thank you so much. I'll, of course, make sure to include all those links in the show notes. And uh, thanks again for sharing your knowledge with us, Dr. Rita Marie. Thank you for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to do so. All right. Well, we are going to answer questions for about 10, 15 minutes. If there are 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. Okay. So I know we have a few questions so far. And um, so let's start with someone who's in one of the Facebook groups. Um, so my insulin level is 6.5 and hemoglobin A1C is 4.8. So uh, are these numbers optimal? Sounds like uh, based on what you said, insulin may be a little bit over uh, higher than you want to see and hem hemoglobin A1C looks good, correct? Yeah, hemoglobin A1C looks perfect. I would look at, I would get a meter and do postprandial just to see where your levels are. With that hemoglobin A1C, when the insulin's high like that, 
um, or a little high. It's not terribly high, but oftentimes the reason the A1C is 4.8 is because you have wide fluctuations, right? That you go very low because of the higher insulin and then you go high and then you go low again. So I'd get yourself a meter or a continuous glucose monitor, but you can get for 15 bucks at any any store, any pharmacy, you get a meter and just check it for a few days and just see where it's at. Yeah. Uh, what do you recommend as far as the postprandial insulin? What? Well, the postprandial insulin is harder to say because you can't test it at home. So it depends on what they've eaten, what their carbohydrate load is, but I don't like to see it go above 12. For okay. For postprandial. For postprandial glucose, I like to see it at... Um, no more than 110 would be the, the peak. And then it comes back down. And that peak is usually 45 minutes to an hour. And then you said like, did you say 30 to 45 minutes after they eat is when you would have them? Test yeah, somewhere them. between a half an hour and an hour. But here's what happens. You get a meter and you start to test and you'll figure out what your peak is. And then, you know, you know, and it's fairly consistent unless you have wide swings in your carbohydrate load in your meals. Okay. So you would give them instructions like, you know, schedule an appointment, let's say for a lab. So, you know, you have, you know, th this time you're going in at two o'clock and then, you know, give them specific instructions. Eat. Oh, for the postprandial insulin. Yeah. Correct. For postprandial insulin, insulin or glucose. Yeah. To an hour. The, yeah. the glucose, you just can get your own meter, right? Or you can pay oh, them sure. yeah. fifty dollars to do a glucose tolerance test yeah. and they make you drink all that crappy sh sugar syrup, which is well, anyway, but, or you can do your own glucose tolerance test at home, right? Eat your highest carbohydrate meal and then monitor your glucose over the, the course of a few hours after you've monitored your normal meals, right? So you don't want to just like throw in this high carb meal and go, oh, there's a problem, right? It could be, you know, that you're normal, but then you just have to watch what you eat in terms of your carbohydrate load. All right. Well, thanks for expanding on that. And we have a question from Teresita. So um, is there a test for cortisol? Which uh, So the answer definitely is yes. And yeah, I'd love to hear what, what testing do you recommend when it comes yeah, to cortisol? Yeah. So you can do a blood cortisol. The problem with doing a blood cortisol is you're not going to go in throughout the day to see what it is. And um, cortisol has a circadian rhythm to it. So it's going to be the highest when you first wake up and then it starts to go down throughout the day. Actually, it's, it goes up. It's, it's kind of at a almost high level when you first get up and then it goes to peaks about half an hour later. So most people miss that. So my favorite way to do it is a Dutch test, which is a urine test. You just pee on these little strips. It measures it throughout the day. You can also do a saliva test for it. And that's another way to do it. All right. Agree. Yeah. When I, dealt with Graves. Personally, I did saliva testing and I've done that for years, but then more recently I've kind of done a mix. You know, I do a lot of Dutch mm -hmm. testing as well. And right. you know, I, I like Dutch testing, especially if they want to go beyond the adrenals and look at the sex okay. hormones and sex hormone metabolites. So. And then there's other things you can get, even when you're looking at cortisol on a Dutch test, because you get the metabolites. And so you can tell, uh, is the body producing a lot, but it's not uh, activated or is it not clearing? Gives you an idea of thyroid status as well from some of those metabolites. Yes, I agree with that. And um, so Teresita with another question here. So I'm not sure she did direct this at you. I'd be happy to handle it if you don't want to handle it, but she's pretty much asking how, um, how often do you recommend eating for a person with Graves who has lost 20 pounds? And I'll, I'll defer to you, but I would say as often as you need to, to not lose weight. So. Yeah, I would agree. Again, this is not a situation where you would want to do intermittent fasting. No. So in this case, I would say just eat irregularly according to schedule. I mean, I think in most cases, it's fine to do that 12 hour window. So if you want to, you know, like if you yeah. stop eating at, let's say 637 and then, you know, when you wake up, you want to have breakfast at 637. I think in most cases, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. listen to your body. I mean, if you feel like you absolutely need to eat sooner, that that's also the challenge with Graves too, which I can relate with when I dealt with hyperthyroidism is the voracious appetite. Um, so it's, sometimes it might be challenging even for 12 hours to go 12 hours, but I would say most people could do that. But yeah, I don't, I wouldn't try to go 16, 18 hours. Oh, when no. it comes I to wouldn't do that. Thing. And I, and during the day, you, you know, you eat, here's the thing you can measure. So you can use like a, an app called like chronometer 
And with the chronometer, you can put in everything you're eating and keep track of your weight. So you know that I'm losing this much weight on 1500 calories a day. So therefore, if I want to maintain, I need to add 500 calories a day or 300. Or if I want to gain, I need to add even more. So you kind of figure it out. And then you really do, if you're trying to lose back, uh, gain back the weight you lost, you really do have to be conscientious. Same way somebody who's trying to lose weight can't just like haphazardly just keep eating. You've got to, you know, be very deliberate about it. All right. Yes. I agree with that. And, um, and right now we don't have any other questions. If there's any other questions, uh, last call for questions, but I actually have a quick question for, oh, I, I won't say a quick, maybe it'll take a minute or so, but so not a real long question. Just want to pick your brain for a minute. And if you don't have, you know, if you don't have the answer, that's fine. But with thyroid hormone resistance, so we mentioned sometimes the thyroid panel will look normal. Sometimes you might get an elevation of thyroid hormone, but also get that elevation in TSH instead of TSH being low. And you also, I'm sure you know, like in some cases, you'll get not thyroid hormone resistance related, but sometimes you'll get T4 looking good and T3 low, which might indicate a conversion problem, problem mm -hmm. conversion T4 to T3. Which, if you, I don't know if you have experience. What if you have you seen any patients where T3 is high but T4 is low? So kind of like the opposite pattern where I have like not as over conversion or some, or over conversion, guess, right? And you know, I always ask about their sex hormones there because testosterone could be involved, right? Testosterone can cause that conversion to be too much. Um, you also see a disparity between the free hormones and the total hormones. So if they have um, higher mm. than what you'd expect on the free hormones versus the total, you would see that's oftentimes in testosterone. So I ask about supplementation. Um, I ask about, um, I, you know, the Dutch test would give us some, some indications there as well. Yeah. And that, that wouldn't be a sign of thyroid hormone resistance where like T4 is low. Cause I mean, again, this, the, I'm bringing up a specific case where a patient recently, her free T4 was, um, I think it was actually depressed. It was like 2.1. So that's, yeah. uh, or not, no, I'm sorry. No, the, free, the free T4, I'm sorry. The free, yeah, the free T4 was low. So 2.1 actually would be high for the free T4. Anyway, the free, free T4 was pretty low. Um, it was well below the, the reference range. Um, and then the free T4, Free T3 and the total T3, I believe, were kind of on the higher side. So yeah. do you think that's more of like an overconversion problem? It's an overconversion. Um, or you have to ask, are they taking any, are they taking a thyroid glandular? And she wasn't. Um, in are that they category. taking bioidentical hormones, or, you know, or T3, like Wilson's therapy, where they do just T3. So you have to look at those things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh looks like we're out of questions. So right. I will uh Thank you again, Dr. Rita Marie. Appreciate you give, uh, just sharing your knowledge when it comes to insulin resistance, thyroid resistance, and then also taking the time to answer some questions. We do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.